So Richard, how do you describe how do we fix it? Serious. Playful. Open-minded. Argumentative. Liberal-leaning. Libertarian. Oh, we don't always have the same politics. But we do agree on this. For every problem, there ought to be a solution. A smart solution. We talk solutions on how do we fix it. With Jim Meggs. And Richard Davies. How do we fix it? In fact, that distrust, that xenophobia, that prejudice, that is the turf upon which social progress must be made. It is the challenge that we must endure in the process of coping with demographic change. The Village Square, a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that disagreement and dialogue make for a good conversation, a good country, and a good time. At the Village Square, we talk about politics, religion, and race. You know, the topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. Listen, at the Village Square, we make pigs fly. Welcome to Village Square Cast. This is Vanessa Rouse. Thanks for joining us for Majority Minority with Dr. Justin Guest. Dr. Guest will help us understand how societies navigate major demographic change. And guess what? We're not alone, and we're not the first to be in this situation. So we're fortunate that Dr. Guest has studied other areas of the world where great demographic change has occurred, so now he can share what works and what doesn't. Dr. Justin Guest is an Associate Professor of Policy and Government at George Mason University's Shar School of Policy and Government. He is the author of six books, including his most recent, Majority Minority. He writes primarily on the topics of immigration and demographic change. Justin has appeared on ABC, BBC, CBC, CNN, and NPR, And he's contributed to The Atlantic, The Boston Globe, The Guardian, Los Angeles Times, The New York Times, Politico, Reuters, The Times, Vox, and The Washington Post. Quiz on that later, so I hope you wrote it down. Justin has also received the highest award for faculty teaching at both Harvard and George Mason University. And check this out. Justin is one of a very few speakers that we've invited back twice And that's because we think his message and his research is critical to navigating the complicated situation that we're in. I just have to tell you that the prior program with him, The New Minority, based on his book of the same name, is one of my top five favorite Village Squarecast episodes. And that's because I personally really needed to hear his message. He addressed an area where I was stuck. That's episode 47, The New Minority. So check it out if you haven't already, but definitely start here. I think this one is actually the perfect starting place to to dive into Justin's work. All right, here to facilitate the discussion is another fascinating person, Manu Meal, CEO of Bridge USA and social entrepreneur who's passionate about empowering young people. Manu was inspired to start what is now Bridge USA when he was a freshman and witnessed the protests on the campus of UCAL Berkeley over a planned visit by right-wing provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos. Bridge USA is an organization that aims to promote democracy, not partisanship. And now they have 43 campus chapters in 19 states. Manu was recently named to Forbes' 30 under 30 in education. I told you he was fascinating. All right, before we get started, we'd like to give a quick shout out to Florida Humanities for partnering with us to present this podcast series. Check them out online at floridahumanities.org. All right, time to get on with the program. Here is Manu Meal, and he will momentarily bring in Dr. Justin Guest. Take it away, guys. Thank you so much. I want to get two things out of the way, and then I'm going to ask some questions. The first is that I took 
uh, Dr. Guest's permission to be able to call him Justin. So anyone that is concerned about the way that I refer to Justin from now on, know that I have special permission. Um, and, and second, as someone that has written zero books, I have to say that the book that I read from Justin has just been fascinating. Majority Minority, it is an amazing read and importantly, and this is where I want to get into it, uh, the key question and the key reason that the book starts off with is that in 2044, the US Census has reported that the United States will officially be a majority minority country. And you're probably wondering what that means, and we're going to get right into it. And before that, I want to give a quick overview of the program. So for the first about 20 minutes, we're going to just lay out the book. What is the argument? What is the thesis? What are the problems that we're contending with? The second section is I'm going to ask some uh, what I call thornier questions, questions that get at the theory, the argument, to dig deeper into it. The section after that is for you, the audience. Would love to hear your questions. Let us know what you're thinking. Anything that you felt was provocative, anything that got you thinking, because ultimately, as, as I've learned from this book, the only way that we get over this obstacle slash problem slash opportunity, however you think about it, is by actually talking. So I'll turn it right over to you, Justin. Why write the book? Thanks, Manu. You know, there's so many reasons to, uh, to, to write this book in, in my life. You know, personally, before we kind of get into the, the scholarly reasons behind it, you know, I grew up in a majority minority environment. And of course, by majority minority, what I mean is where one or more ethnic or religious minority groups come to outnumber the ethnic or racial majority of a space. And that was Los Angeles, California for me. I went to majority minority schools during my childhood, uh, and I grew up in one of the world's most diverse cities. And um, in many ways, that presaged the uh, demographic change that was going to uh, come over the United States uh, you know, later in my life. Um, but it was something that I was always acutely attentive to, uh, even as a youngster. I was the, I'm the son of a refugee, you know, who is part of a wave of immigration during the 20th century um, that fundamentally changed the complexion of this country. Um, and so immigration and demographic change is part of who I am. It's uh, it's and of course, as Americans, I think it's part of who all of us are. But in my family, uh, that journey, that experience was more recent. You know, for scholarly reasons, my work has always been in this space. Uh, about immigration. But what interests me not only uh, is, is, is the governance of immigration, the, the way a, a society manages who we let in, how we select them, and, and who gets to be a member. Um, those questions have always fascinated me. But what also has always fascinated me is the reception of those immigrants, the consequences of immigration. Uh, and as we've seen you know, over the course of the last decade or so, um, the backlash to immigration has been really brutal. It's been incredibly grave. And uh, it's really been defining our politics. I, I think a very good argument could be made that immigration and demographic change, the shadow of this demographic change, is in many ways the fulcrum uh, of our political partisanship, is our, the fulcrum of our partisan differences, uh, the issue that so many things uh, rotate around. And so, you know, the prospect of a majority minority demographic future, to me, was a sort of shadow that was cast over our politics. Uh, and it infused my earlier works on immigration policy, on white working class politics, on Muslim politics. Um, the specter of that demographic change was always there. And in this book, I wanted to hit it right on the head. Let me ask you this, and I'm going to actually split up both of the question sections into two parts. So th this one specifically, you said, this is about who I am. And that is, to me, what makes this issue so difficult to, to resolve is because it's about who we are. And you mentioned in the book that a key uh, piece of this work is expanding the definition of we. Can you explain what people think of when they think of we right now as, as the United States? And I know that it varies by whoever you're asking, but I'm curious. Yeah, there's no way I could possibly explain who we think of as we. This is precisely, I think, the national conversation that demographic change stimulates, mm -hmm. you know, because when immigrants arrive, the first question that comes to everyone's mind is, who are they? Right. Who's that over there? Where they come from? Where they like? Where they believe? Where they want? Where they here for? Mm. Right. It's a natural question. Like, right? who are you? The second question, I think, though, uh, is where we are today, which is once we've responded to the question of who are they, usually there's a desire to make them more like us or to at least make them fit in with us. It's like, OK, well, if they are going to be here with us, then they need to be a little bit more like us. Okay, well, then that stimulates this number two question, which is, who are we? Mm. And that's where we are. 
And the third question, by the way, that we want to eventually get to is, who can we be together? And I think that those simple questions, who are they, who are we, and who can we be together, are fundamental to this entire issue. And, you know, some people believe that immigration and assimilation is a, is a one-way street, that newcomers arrive and that they should adapt in every way possible uh, to assimilate into whatever the mainstream is, you know, we decide the mainstream to be. That's a, that's a simplification, I think. Uh, and it also presumes that there is only one mainstream. And it presumes that that mainstream is somehow static, that it doesn't evolve, that it doesn't change with the composition of our population. There's another view that sees it as a two-way street, right? That who we are and who they are are both relevant to who we will become. And that integration is a two-way street and that newcomers will adapt, but those of us who are, are here uh, will also adapt to their presence. And maybe we'll even learn from their presence and gain from their presence and be better for their presence because of what we learn from them and the relationships that we build together. Yeah. And that'll be a source of strength. But certainly that fundamental question of who we are is central and provoked by demographic change, but is also central to the identity politics that is shredding our social fabric right now. Dean, Richard, Frank, all the others that have questions, please continue submitting them. We're going to answer them in the Q&A. Appreciate your engagement. You said, who are they? Who are we? Who can we be together? What about this issue and what about this notion of immigration makes it so difficult to talk about? You know, why is it that the concept of a majority minority status is something that is so significant? You know, again, it's going to be a, a, a to each their own kind of situation, um, but everyone's going to come at it with some degree of gravity. And, and the reason why, of course, is that it, it's somewhat existential of a question. You know, as a democracy, um, we are who we are comprised by. You know, we are constituted by the people, by the population, you know, th that lives here. And so when that population changes, it is only natural for us to anticipate that our society and our country will change with it. Um, you know, we don't have, you know, this uh, sort of uh, second class citizenship, at least not formally, uh, to, to, to separate, you know, people apart. Generally speaking, over the course of U.S. history, we have evolved over time and changed with the composition of our population. And so there's no reason to think that that will stop now. That is what raises the stakes uh, when it comes to demographic change, because inevitably um, there are going to be some people in our society who are invigorated by that demographic change and they hotly anticipate it and are and are thrilled by it and are, and are excited to experience what it will mean for the country's evolution and, and betterment. Uh, but then there are also others who are fundamentally discomforted by that demographic change, by the uncertainty that it stimulates, um, by the sense uh, by the questioning and, and the insecurities that we have as a society. And as a result, it, cre it, it creates a lot of nostalgia, uh, people who want to hit the brakes uh, not anticipating the future, but in many ways resisting its progress uh, in ways that are probably not even sustainable. So, you know, I think that most people come at this issue with a great degree of gravity um, because of its existential nature. I want to I want to put a pin in that question of existential because it gets at a, a very recent current event, the 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 Buffalo shooting. But I want to I want to hold that for a second and zoom out and allow you space to make the broader argument, which is. I think what you just got at there, which is that there's a balance between some that feel invigorated and excited, see this as an opportunity, and others that feel this to be a risk to their power. How do you reconcile those? And how do you ensure that those two groups of people, whoever they may be, find some sort of common cause in answering the question, who can we be together? Yeah, this is a fundamental question. And you know what this book does to help us find an answer, to arrive at some conclusions, is it looks at other societies that have gone through this question before. It looks at other places who can help us understand how societies respond to demographic change. And so, you know, most people think that the United States is kind of, you know, on an island, if you will, right now. You know, we're on our own, and this is sort of breaking new ground. And in many ways, I think we are. You know, we are an enormous society uh, and, uh, and a big democracy um, that is about to go through this fundamental demographic change. But while we are, it is a rare milestone to have a majority minority uh, shift, it's not unique to the United States. Uh, it has happened before. It's just happened to very small microcosmic societies 
um, many of which are islands. And the, and, the, and, the, and the countries that I study, the societies that I study, all happen to be islands. It's not where I pick them, but it just so happens that they're islands. And it's not that surprising. Islands are, are exposed to as crossroads uh, of the world because they are you know, approachable from all different angles uh, in, in the sea. Um, they are historically a, a sort of a nexus, I think, in, in, during empire and, and colonialism, and, and certainly today with global commerce. And um, islands are also interesting because they're kind of like laboratories, uh, these small microcosms. So we can study them as a laboratory, uh, as, as an example of, of what happens uh, when human societies are confronted with great demographic shifts. So the countries that I study are Mauritius, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Singapore and Bahrain, and Hawaii and New York. And New York, of course, is not its own country, although many New Yorkers wish they were their own country. But uh, they- Or they they're not really Texas yet. They're not Texas yet. <laughs> Texas is probably in the same category along <laughs> with California, uh, my home state. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, New York simulates the same kind of uh, sovereign uh, country feeling historically because New York uh, once had sovereign control over who was admitted in, yeah. uh, from an immigration perspective and who was deported. And the same, by the way, is true for Hawaii, which, while it's not its own country today, was its own sovereign kingdom up until 1893 when the United States government forcibly annexed it. And so all of these societies do simulate uh, sovereign control over immigration and had to respond to enormous demographic change. And I know we'll get into the details yeah. uh, of these different places soon. But to get to your question, I think most people, when they are um, talking about uh, the prospects for demographic change and how we uh, respond to it, I think most people are very concerned today with the eradication of racism and prejudice and xenophobia and nativism. And they say that only when we can eradicate these scourges from American society, from any society that's diversifying, can we actually expect to make progress socially. Yeah. But in my book, I actually argue something different. Uh, across the different societies that I study, even the most successful adaptations that were made there was still prejudice. There was still racism. There is still nativism and distrust and xenophobia to some degree. In, in many ways, uh, what I find is that, in fact, uh, that distrust, that xenophobia, that prejudice, that is the turf upon which social progress must be made. It is the challenge that we must endure in the process of coping with demographic change. And in fact, we're not subject to these uncontrollable you know, human prejudices all the time. What I find actually, oh, and ultimately, is that immigration and demographic change is ultimately subject to good governance. Mm. It is a milestone that must be managed. We must be conscious of how we are actually governing the shift and preparing a people for demographic change, particularly when we see it on the horizon. And that's something that our country has simply not done much of uh, which is what gives me hope for the future, because I think there are things we can do to pivot towards greater inclusion and away from the politics of exclusion. There, there's so much there in that answer, and I've got so many different routes that I can take this conversation, and so I'm going to do my best. I, I, I've got three sort of avenues I want to take this, but first I'm going to ask what might seem like a stupid question. 23, you got to give me a break. So the stupid question I've got is, why talk about this? Like, you know, it's not like in 2044, suddenly everyone's going to feel that, you know, there's there's a majority minority country. You know, we still see diversity. I see that, you know, there's people that look different than me around me. What is your response to those that say that even talking about this argument actually makes it a problem? That we can just naturally transition into this because we're kind of already there in many communities. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would love that. I, I, I wish we wouldn't have talk about it so much, actually. But I'm not the one that's starting this conversation. You know, in many ways, this milestone, and as I mentioned earlier, the sort of shadow of this milestone, which I think is much greater, much larger, the shadow that's cast by it is much larger than the actual milestone itself in terms of its significance for our country. Uh, I think it's really overblown. But nevertheless, it's there. And to try to pretend otherwise by just saying, oh, let's just not talk about it. Uh, it's to not acknowledge an enormous you know, pink elephant in the proverbial room. It is something that is defining, that is contorting you know, and manipulating our politics today in a way I think that we can better understand. And so if we don't seek to understand it, and if we only ignore it, uh, then we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes that other societies have made. So there appears to be a tension that I'm, I'm trying to resolve. And that tension is, 
that this is both, and this is sort of that first of three paths. So the tension seems to be that this isn't actually something that we should be talking about in a way that is that significant, but because honestly it's happening in many places, but at the same time, it is significant in that most societies don't experience this. So how do you walk that balance? And I think the reason why that is a relevant thing to think about is because again, walking that balance, there are those that are trying to posture this moment as a huge opportunity. And there are others that are posturing this as an existential risk. So would you say that this is a significant thing that is so unique that we should rally around and try to solve? Or should we treat this not as a significant problem, but just create spaces to talk about? You know, how do you, how do you navigate that balance? Oh, I'm not sure that those two things are mutually exclusive. Uh, I, I think that even if we acknowledge it as a big problem, we still have to talk about it. Hmm. And, and, and I think it is, it is incontrovertibly a problem. You know, this is, as I, you know, asserted earlier, you know, I, I think that this is the fulcrum uh, around which our politics and partisanship is revolving right now. You have one party in this country that is, you know, cosmopolitan and globalistic and ushering into a future, you know, and rushing into that future uh, as quickly as possible, um, eager to, to evolve into some kind of demographic destiny. And then you have another party that is nationalist and nostalgic uh, and consumed with with the past and looking to assert control, and and so I think to to you know to ignore this and just simply say you know well something that we kind of work out through a sort of therapy uh, is not enough. I think it has to be governed. I think that the yeah. government, uh, I think uh, our government, I think our business leaders, I think our civil society leaders all need to pitch in. We need millions of people who are prepared. Uh, to to actually start having this conversation, these conversations that are stimulated by demographic change, uh, to talk about this question of who are we and, and who we want to be together. I just want to say this is such a fascinating and important discussion. The way that you're navigating this conversation is, I think, exactly how we should be navigating it, which is thinking about the questions and talking about them in a constructive way. Let me take you down path two, um, and this gets to a current event. You mentioned the existential risk that this poses. Let's be honest, and you articulate this in the book, that that's primarily the majority white population in the United States, that that is the group um, writ large, obviously without trying to generalize too much, that would have the most to quote unquote lose when you are actually trying to get at the, the core question. There was a shooting in Buffalo, as we all know, where the shooter, an 18 year old man, had a manifesto that talked about the great replacement theory. Can you apply that notion of existential risk to that act? How should we be discussing that question and how should we be tackling it? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the grand replacement theory uh, or replacement theory is connected directly, you know, wired to the majority minority milestone. It, it, it asserts a conspiracy that there are elites uh, largely led by Jews, they argue, who are interested in replacing white Christian and the white Christian population of countries, not just the United States, but also in Europe, they allege, with non-white peoples, uh, apparently in some kind of effort towards world domination. Uh, and I'm not really sure how those two things are connected, but I'm sure replacement theory theorists could explain it. In any case, the majority minority milestone is, I think, in many ways, uh, the sort of culmination of that nightmare scenario for white supremacists and white nationalists. It is that sort of uh, point of no return uh, that they fear so much. And so inevitably, you know, demographic change is, is hardwired into their, their conspiracy theory. And it is leading people to react um, in, in violent ways. And that is a product of us not having a real conversation about what our future looks like. It is the product of us not having a real conversation about how this is actually just a part of a greater evolution of this country. And that in fact, we've been here before, that this is not actually our first majority minority milestone. Uh, and this is something that I'm sure you and I will get into later. So it's a good tease. But the how being a country whose demographics uh, evolve over time um, is something that is inevitably part of our future, but also part of our past. It is who we are today. And so to understand how we've navigated the past and how we want to navigate the future, um, that is something that we cannot ignore. Otherwise, we leave the, the public sphere 
uh, to be dominated by fear mongers, you know, by exclusivists and by conspiracy theorists. Um, we leave the, the sort of media pu uh, public sphere to be run by algorithms, uh, which is what is produced where we are today. We have largely not you know, applied any kind of handlebars to this debate because we're not talking about it honestly uh, and, and in, in an informed manner. And so the really tragic events of Buffalo uh, are a manifestation uh, of this and the sense of lost control uh, that many you know, white people feel about this majority minority milestone that they believe is so existential. Right. So I want to now start getting to the solutions aspect of this. Um, you mentioned six case studies. Um, the way that I'm going to split up this part of the conversation is first talk about the the individual. I think you make a lot of cases and arguments for expanding the definition of we, how we as people need to address this. But then the second thing that you've hinted at, which is it's governable. And so I want to get at some policy solutions and some tangible things that policymakers can do. Does that, does that sound good as a flow? You're cool. in control. You're in the driver's seat here. Cool, cool. So in terms of the individual, you outlined six case studies. Which of these six, and I think you split it up two, two, two. So which one of those would you articulate is the most instructive example for how the United States should approach this question, but specifically how we as individuals should approach this question? Because I want to keep the governable part separate. So how should we as people approach this question based on the case studies that you found? Sure. So there are three there are three different types of cases, as you mentioned. I actually don't think that there's one or, or another that is more instructive. There's certainly more hopeful, you know, uh, endings to some of these or at least uh, endings to the story so far uh, in some places or others. But they all hold lessons, you know, for the United States and, and, and for Western democracies that are diversifying today. You know, the first set, Singapore and Bahrain, uh, these are are autocratic countries. They're non-democratic spaces where the government asserts enormous amounts of control over demographic change uh, in order to resist it and to control the ethnic or religious makeup of their population. Um, the second set of countries, and so I call those countries suppressive in nature, they're characterized by suppression. The other set of countries, the second set of countries are Trinidad and Tobago and Mauritius. Uh, these are island nations uh, in, in the East Caribbean and the Western Indian Ocean respectively that are democracies but they are highly racialized democracies uh, where the political parties are deeply connected to different racial groups. Uh, in the case of these two countries, it's uh, people of Indian origin and people of African origin. Uh, and they're characterized by you know, terrible ethnic tension uh, between the groups politically and, and total paralysis politically. Mm -hmm. And the, the final set of, group, of, of cases are New York and Hawaii, uh, both of which are obviously now part of the United States. But as I mentioned earlier, Hawaii was once sovereign and independent. And, you know, these are two more hopeful cases um, because the, over the course of their history, the question of who are we uh, was subject to reconstitution, a sort of redefinition of who we are uh, after really great uh, ethnic or, or democratic, demographic change. Um, obviously, these were democratic spaces, although Hawaii was actually a monarchy a kingdom that change the conception of who they are in order to accommodate and adapt to their demographic inevitabilities, their demographic futures. Hmm. And we can learn something from each of these, you know, Manu, like, you know, there are, there are countervailing trends. So if just wow. for instance, Singapore, you know, I mentioned is autocratic and they utilize racial tension and racial differences in, in almost every expression of governance there. Uh, in the provision of social services and education of children, um, in immigration selection, everything is done according to what they call race. And race there is defined uh, uh, by whether you are Chinese, the vast majority of, of Singaporean population, Indian, most of whom are Tamil uh, origins, and, uh, and Malay, uh, who are from uh, the, the, effectively the indigenous population uh, in the Southeast uh, Asian uh, context. And, you know, that is a you know not a great way of managing things. It's very suppressive. On the other hand, uh, Singapore is I think a paragon of actual sophisticated thought put into how to create one nation, how to answer the question of who we are and who we will be together. And so even while the government does all kinds of you know terrible tactics in my mind uh, to reinforce a lot of ethnic and racial divisions inside their society. Um, they're also actively thinking about how to promote ha harmony 
uh, and a sense of, of common identity and common purpose in their country. Um, and so these countervailing trends means that we can take something good and, and something bad uh, away from almost any context. So I'm curious because I think a big a big part of the book, and especially in those six case studies, you talk a lot about the role that leaders play in, in the in-groups and the out-groups. Can you pull apart the level of responsibility that leaders have in this question of navigating uh, race and the majority minority milestone versus the responsibility that we as people have? Because it appears to me that leaders play a big role, but ultimately it's up to the people and how they interact. How do you sort of pull those two apart? Sure. So at, at its core, when we're talking about uh, differences between a majority and a minority group, uh, when we're talking about race, when we're talking about ethnicity, these boundaries are completely socially constructed. And what that means are they are what we make of them. There is nothing biological behind them. We are asserting the lines that divide people. And leaders play an enormous role in the construction of those boundaries and the significance that we attribute to them uh, because they tell us how to understand them in a way uh, that is much more powerful because of the size of their proverbial megaphone, right? So as a result, leaders hold outsized weight and power to help us not only understand where boundaries lie, but also what boundaries mean. And so across these different societies, we see the role that leaders can play. And we also see the temptations that man, many leaders fall into and succumb to when they are incentivized to use those boundaries in order to divide so that they can win in elections. And so the role of leaders cannot be understated. Um, but it's important that I also you know, emphasize that leaders are not just in government. They do emerge in the business space, they emerge in the civil society space, and all of us, even down to the leaders of nuclear families, have a role to play in discussing and, and asserting um, the importance or the lack of significance of these boundaries that are dividing us today. Do you think that the backlash to demographic change when it comes to uh, local leaders, national leaders, community and civic leaders, do you think that that backlash is a uniquely Western and white phenomenon, or do you think that that backlash is a human condition? It's a result of human nature. It's very much a human condition. So um, heretofore, you know, I, I'm by far not the first researcher who was interested in studying the effect of demographic change. However, I- You did a great job. <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks so much. Well, I stand on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> and there are a number of giants who, who have studied this. Um, however, most of those giants are psychologists or political psychologists. And when you're a psychologist, your, your unit of analysis is the individual. And so you are usually testing the effect of some kind of treatment, the exposure to some information or some environment on people's um, viewpoints and behavior. And so what mostly psychologists have done up until now is that they have exposed people to information about great demographic change or they have you know, simulated the demographic change that's going to take place. But psychology experiments take place you know, in, a, in a few minutes, you know, in a very short setting. Um, one of the longest treatments actually involved 10 days. So you know, demographic change takes a lot longer than 10 days to take place. Uh, it takes decades. Uh, sometimes it takes a full century uh, to really hold its effect. And so while these giants in psychology, what, their work is very important because what it showed uh, was that people's instinctive differences, instinctive reactions uh, to demographic change and being notified of great demographic change is to respond defensively, often territorially, often with exclusion uh, and fear and uncertainty. That is the sort of natural human instinct when exposed uh, to rapid demographic change. But we just don't know what happens at the societal level uh, when you have decades uh, of demographic change that take that takes place far slower than these psychology experiments can possibly simulate. Demographic change is a is a block by block phenomenon. It's it's a it's a year by year, decade by decade phenomenon that's slow and it and, and it takes time to take effect. And sometimes you don't notice when it's happening um, because it moves so slowly, much like you don't notice the barometric pressure around you or the rotation of the Earth on its axis. And so. If we're really going to understand how people respond to demographic change at a societal level, we have to look at a societal level. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, for that reason, 
Um, while I engage in some kind of political psychological, psychological techniques uh, towards the end of the book to really understand political behavior a little bit better uh, in the face of demographic change, I also want to look at these countries' experiences and have the benefit of looking at the long uh, durée of history uh, to better understand what happens. Yeah, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna slowly take my cue and get get to the governable questions. You know, the societal level. What are some tangible things that policymakers can look at? The last question I have on the individual side is. You mentioned it's a block by block phenomenon and what we found at bridge and we work with you know young people across universities and campuses is that people want to be a part of a community you know people want ultimately to be part of an identity and you mention the american identity and as being unique in that it's primarily thin nationalism right the american identity is not as cohesive and as strong as say being german right how can you build Maybe you want to problematize that notion, and I'm curious about it. But how can you build, how can you build community in 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 this majority minority world that potentially transcends race and ethnicity, or is it not possible? Oh no, it's totally possible. We've we've already done it in the United States. You know, I think this is, um, you know, an opportunity to talk about two things. You know, first off, you know, you mentioned Germany. If you talk to Germans, they have similar insecurities about the fragility of their nationality, the fragility of their society. Um, they are going through their own, you know, extreme moment with uh, the far right and far left gaining power, and you know they are su subject to a lot of social instability. Even if, in many ways, they look like a model of geopolitical stability right now, you know, countries always look far more stable than they actually are when you're looking at them from the outside. Um, when you are so much more, sub you know, sensitive. Uh, to our own issues and our own divisions, you know, your own country always feels much more fragile, much less stable. Much my more house is my house is always struggling compared to the other house. Yeah, you know, we, you know too much. You just yeah. know too much, so you have a much more complex understanding of of your own country than you ever will of, of someone else's, and and that's why the grass just looks greener over there. And, and, and that's why I kind of reacted when you mentioned Germany, because, you know, they're having this conversation too right now. Remember, they're the country that admitted over a million uh, asylum seekers, um, you know, in 2015, 2016, and they continue to do so with uh, Ukrainian refugees who are arriving. Um, so, you know, they're having their own moment right now, even if they don't have the majority but, but, of them. Could, could, I, could I just ask, I know there's a second piece you want to get to, but I, I am curious about this because you do you do bring up the notion of, of thin nationalism. Maybe I'm applying it wrong, but... When you do say the word German, there are certain cultural attachments to that word, right? There's a there's a culture, there's a society there, there's a there's an identity. Whereas I think one of the arguments you made in the book was that America, when you think of American, is kind of open interpretation. And maybe it's that Germany is slowly getting to that point. But do you think there's a difference in, in those identities or, or is that something that I'm fabricating? The only difference is that there is a sense of rooted heritage in Germany and the continuity of that heritage mm -hmm. um, that, you know, a settler state like the United States or Australia or Canada uh, does not boast. You know, the continuity of heritage in, in our countries was disrupted because it was the heritage of Native Americans and indigenous peoples. Uh, that, of course, were subject to genocide and, and, and mistreatment uh, by colonists and, and settlers. You know, our, our history in many ways starts uh, with the founding of, of sovereign modern nations uh, in, in the 18th century. And so that is something that is fund fundamentally different from uh, old European countries. But remember that even old European countries were subject to lots of construction and compilation. Uh, Germany itself was a federation of many smaller states, and it changed with the borders of Prussia uh, and, and, and the Roman Empire, you know, before that. So, you know, these things are, 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 are always, as I say, look more simple from the outside. Um, the same is true for Italy. You know, Britain, which is a very old nation, obviously, uh, is a multi-ethnic nation with the divisions between Wales and Scotland and the Northern Irish, of course. Um, and they are also subject to enormous amounts of immigration today. So while I do think that that continuity of heritage is there, I, I think it's overrated because it, it's all being questioned uh, with the diversification of their countries, with greater secularism and greater globalization and cosmopolitanism. Yeah. The, and again, thanks for sort of entertaining my my random slip in question there. It's just you do such a great job of deconstructing this that I got to get all my questions out. No worries. No worries.
I, I thought this was a good opportunity to also just assert and problematize the idea of being a majority minority country in the United States here. You know, we are subject to those same evolutions. So when the United States was founded, what it meant to be the majority, of course, was associated with whiteness. But whiteness itself in those days referred to a Northern European, mostly Anglo, Protestant uh, whiteness. And over the course of the late 19th century, that changed. In 1845 until 1854, the Great Famine in Ireland um, pushed an influx of Irish uh, into the United States in, at numbers that we were completely unseen in the history of, of our country. And then thereafter, they were followed by Germans, by Greeks, by Slavs, by Jews, by Italians. And, you know, suddenly what it meant to be white was questioned, because if you think of whiteness from that old 18th century and 19th century lens, you know, the United States, you know, whiteness ended, you know, in terms of its majority status, ended probably somewhere around the beginning of the 20th century. Those white ethnic groups that I mentioned earlier uh, overtook uh, white Anglo and white Northern European Protestants around that time. What ended up happening is we simply changed the way that we understood whiteness to eventually embrace those white ethnic groups, you know, the, the Greeks and the Slavs and the Italians, um, those all became what we now say are white people, but they never were back then, not in the sort of traditional definition of whiteness. And what that did was not only did it postpone our ultimate majority minority uh, milestone, which we now see it's revealed to be just something totally constructed, but it also allowed for the continued subjugation of people who were not white, who were not assimilable enough, uh, who were not presentable enough as white, who didn't come close enough to qualifying. And that might have meant uh, Middle Easterners initially and Southeast Asians, South Asians. Um, but it also, of course, in, in, it led to the, subject, the continued subjugation of African Americans and then thereafter Latinos. And so, you know, our own country is more complicated than we look at from the outside. And this majority minority milestone is subject to precisely those same evolutions now. Uh, there is a white Hispanic group of Americans, people who are Hispanic and self-identify as white. That's 60% of all Latinos that very well may just only self-identify as white in the future. We have a growing number of mixed race and biracial people in our country uh, who very well may self-identify as white. That would also postpone our you know, majority minority milestone that we expect to take place in 25 years. It might be a lot longer. It may not have ever happen at all. Yeah. I, I, I promised you that I was going to get to the question of it being governable, but you did it again and you said a bunch of smart things. And I and I got, got to ask one more question on on sort of the history of this. OK, uh, you brought up the fact that, you know, the United States has actually gone through majority minority milestones and your New York case study is a great example of Irish Americans um, or at that time, Irish folks, not Americans yet. Do you think it is harder to. Uh, do you think this majority mi minority milestone that's coming up in 2044 is uniquely more difficult than the past milestones because the race, the aesthetic color of folks is different? And this might, I know this is a tough question to answer because I know the book doesn't get into that too much, but does it make it uniquely more difficult to assimilate and to incorporate and to expand the definition of we when those that you're trying to assimilate have a fundamentally different color than yourself? You know, I don't, I don't know because, you know, I think it would be presentist to say that it's harder today. You know, I, I wasn't there in the past and, and my read of the history is that it was pretty hard back then. You know, um, the Irish were so, uh, and of course the Irish were predominantly Catholic uh, after 1845, the Irish were so discriminated against, so excluded, not to the same extent as African-Americans, of course, um, who were denied voting rights, et cetera, after, you know, receiving citizenship. But they were so fundamentally excluded in, in New York society, for instance, uh, that they were forced effectively to create their own institutions. It's why we see Irish and Catholic orphanages and hospitals and schools and universities today. You know, think about, you know, the, the, what, what the conditions had to have been in order to mobilize people uh, to create these institutions so defensively, so protectively. Um, if they were admitted into the mainstream and mainline institutions of the country, 
you know, that you wouldn't have had a need for, you know, Fordham University or, or Catholic University, you know, and these Catholic hospitals and orphanages and schools. They were admit they would have been admitted to them like anyone else. And so I, I've got to imagine that, you know, through the eyes of Irishmen in America's past, you know, that they had it pretty rough. It's it's a conversation without resolution. We'll never know. Um, yeah. But certainly race adds a, a different a, a different layer to all this. Um, but in those days, religion was of paramount importance. Yeah, and and actually, if you if you sort of double clicked on that point, I think there's so much scholarship on how profound religious divisions were, how profound it was to be Protestant as opposed to being a Catholic. Again, the question becomes, and I think this is an argument that actually a lot of left leaning folks would forward, is that race is a is an aesthetic trait that you can't get rid of, and does that make it slightly more difficult? But I think to your point, we we can't really compare. And I don't necessarily know if it's productive too. Hey everyone, my name is Jenna Spinelli and I host and produce a podcast called Democracy Works. It's a collaboration between the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. If you enjoy this podcast, I think you'll like our show too. Every episode examines a different aspect of what it means to live in a democracy. Sometimes it's big picture issues like neoliberalism or demagoguery, and other times it's more on the ground topics like ranked choice voting and how local news deserts are democracy deserts too. Some of our previous guests include Jonathan Haidt, Andrew Sullivan, and even Wynton Marsalis. So I hope you'll check out Democracy Works. You can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. So let's get into the question of governability. You mentioned that the majority minority milestone is governable. That gives me a lot of hope because it means that we have the ability to do something about it. What do you think leaders should do and make the broader case of what do you think leaders should do when 2044 is approaching? What should they start talking about? What should they start implementing? Um, How should they tackle this specific issue or opportunity? Sure. So um, before we talk about um, what they should do. Let's talk a little bit about what governments do do. So in the face of, of great demographic change, the first thing that comes to many governments' minds are, um, how do we control this? You know, how, in some cases, how do we stop it? Um, but usually by the time you're worried about stopping it, it's probably too late because the, the cake is baked. Um, you know, demography has a sort of inevitability to it because of fertility rates it basically uh, becomes an inevitability. But that aside, that hasn't stopped governments from trying. And there's three primary ways that governments try to address demographic change. And I I refer to them as who comes, Mm -hmm. who counts, and who connects. And who comes is a matter of immigration. Who do you let in? Who do you admit into the country? And so governments have done a lot to try to restrict who comes into countries uh, on the basis of racial or ethnic or religious, in some cases, uh, selection. Um, they also deport people sometimes uh, according to uh, their the, the social boundaries that they uh, uh, constitute. Um, so we see countries use immigration policy as a primary policy tool uh, to affect who comes into the country. Who counts is about power. It's about the distribution of power. It's about who literally is counted as a citizen. And that gets down to census politics, gerrymandering of of who is in districts and and, and how you divide power and and voting rights. Um, It comes down to the suppression of voting uh, or the enablement of voting. Uh, It comes down to the way your institutions are formed. You think of like the United States Senate, which is giving outsized weight to uh, sparsely populated rural states or or, or small states uh, who get the same amount of power as a a state like Texas or Florida uh, or California and New York. So all of these matter because it affects literally who counts and the power they're able to wield. And so you see countries often manipulate those institutions in order to preserve the power of the original racial or religious majority. And then who connects is really about intergroup engagement. It's about intergroup contact. And you do see uh, countries engage in this um, with certain limited tools like segregation, uh, like redlining, uh, the segregation of schools and housing uh, discrimination, uh, all of that affects who is connecting and the extent to which people can actually relate to one another and, and, and build something together. Now, now that we understand kind of what countries do to, to control demographic change, the next question is, what do countries and what do governments do 
uh, in order to um, include or exclude. And, and I refer to these as the five pivots uh, of inclusion and exclusion. And so I'll go through each of the five now and you know, feel free to double click on, on any of the five. The first is uh, a national ideology, uh, an idea of who we are uh, and, and the idea of sociologically and, 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 and ideologically um, what makes the country what it is. And those ideologies can be um, very inclusive and sometimes they're related to um, you know, labor unions or they could be related to socialism or they can be related to some kind of nationalism. Uh, and those could be sometimes be very inclusive ideologies. Um, they can be very collectivist and multicultural. Others can be very exclusivist. Uh, they can only honor you know, one side uh, and not the other. And so that's a really key pivot. A second pivot relates to the socialization of youth. And so this refers to the politics of school curricula, uh, the politics of textbooks, the politics of second languages, uh, the politics of, uh, of integration and segregation of schools. This may ring a bell, of course, here in the United States over the last few years when we've had debates over critical race theory, uh, the Don't Say Gay Act uh, in, in, in Florida, um, the book bannings that we've been seeing recently across the United States. Um, these are very fraught politics uh, because they can be inclusive where you have desegregated schools, textbooks that acknowledge, acknowledge the contributions of all of a country's different minority groups and majority groups you know, curricula that acknowledge those contributions more broadly, or they can be more narrow and restrictive. A third uh, is commerce. Uh, commerce, uh, you know, really is a way of bringing people together or separating them. You can bring people together by virtue of their interdependencies uh, that the commercial system creates. You know, we rely on each other for goods and services and expertise in many ways. And we often rely on people who are different from us to help us. But commerce can also be subject to the segmentation of labor markets, uh, where certain people are not eligible for certain jobs, uh, you can uh, you can you can have uh, um, broader markets where you have the racialization of poverty, and and those are obviously toxic uh, to any sense of inclusion. Then you have the politics of culture, inclusive and exclusive culture, and this is where you really get into the politics of the arts and sports, literature, cuisine, music, uh, which are really subject to just remarkable fusion and hybridity. And it can really bring a country together and be very integrative and inclusive in nature. But we've also seen a lot of debates in those spaces uh, where you have debates over the presence of Confederate memorials and monuments across the American South, where you have debates over um, speech and, and, and protected speech when a football player takes a knee uh, while or takes a knee during the national anthem. And so we've seen precisely these cultural areas being subject to divisive politics as well as inclusive politics. And then finally, it's the politics of threat. Uh, whether we identify our threats to be external, like another country, like a virus, Martians, or whether they're, in, or whether they're internal threats, which is very divisive when we believe that the, most, that the greatest threat to our country comes from fellow countrymen, that the greatest threat is actually inside our gates, uh, which of course is obviously gonna be very exclusive in nature. And so those five pivots, uh, ideology, socialization of youth, commerce, culture, and threat uh, are really the pivots on which society makes a decision about how they collectively move towards inclusion and exclusion. And, you know, I think in the modern United States today, we see evidence of all different five pivots going in both directions. Uh, we are very much at a crossroads. You don't say. Let me actually repeat the sort of five pivots, because I think that they, and based on sort of how you've described it, provides a good framework for how to think about it. National ide ideology, socialization of youth, commerce, culture, politics of threat. I wanna take a quick step back, um, and I'm not gonna double click on any of those because I wanna make sure we get the audience questions. You said who counts, who comes, who connects. Let's apply this, and, and I know this is putting you on the spot, and this is probably an unfair question, but, Let's apply this to the Buffalo shooting. You know, how would you ideally want our leaders to react to that shooting? What, what would it entail if, if you had your magic wand and you said, this is how we navigate this specific, because these instances are going to happen more and more, right? And we're going to see more instances of violence based specifically on racial lines. How should we approach something like that? And what should leaders do about that shooting? Our leaders need to model the connection that we are advocating that we must build. We need to see our leaders 
defeat polarization on an individual basis to be the change that they want to see in the world. We need to see uh, political leaders uh, breaking bread with one another across the aisle. We need to see enemies sitting down at the same table, sharing a burger or, or, or a cup of coffee or a beer. You know, we need to see, you know, people of different races and different backgrounds coming together in ways that are, are trying to facilitate mutual understanding, where we are actually airing our senses of grievance, our, our senses of vulnerability in a place that makes people feel safe to do so. Um, you know, earlier you asked what makes this conversation so difficult. And what I failed to mention as well is controversy, is discomfort. You know, these are challenging conversations to have, and they're tended to be, to be held privately uh, in the United States and not publicly because of fears of retaliation or cancellation. And I think we actually need to have it out. You know, ultimately, the, these conversations aren't being had, but they're siloed. And they're not actually a secret because most of them are on the internet. You can, you can see them anytime you want to, but they're not actually crossing anywhere. And so our leaders, I think, in the most public way possible have to, have to encourage these conversations uh, and have them together, but they need to model the change that they want to actually see. And the problem is, I think that politically, uh, our, our leaders are, are very concerned about leveraging our polarization into votes. Uh, and both parties are, 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 are guilty of this to some degree. There, there's a sense that no rewards will come from that kind of outreach. But I really disagree. I think our country is exhausted by polarization. Even if we are complicit in it, I think we're exhausted by it. And so I think that a leader who has the courage, but also the skill to transcend these boundaries uh, would do a lot of good for both themselves and also the country. I don't want to ask any more questions. I want to leave it there because I think if we were in person, that would have been a mic drop moment. I just want to emphasize the notion that leaders have to model. And we've seen this time and time again, Justin, on all the different campuses and all of the conversations we have. And now I'm going to transition into audience questions because there's people far more intelligent than me wanting to ask questions. So let's get into it. Uh, and let's try to keep our answers short because we've got a lot of questions and I wanna make sure we try to get to as many as possible. The first question is that, has there been a culture, and you did talk about this a little bit, but has there been a culture that has transitioned from one majority race to a majority minority without conflict? Yeah, the closest the closest case is Hawaii. Yeah. So when Hawaii, the, the, the short story of Hawaii is that the native population was decimated by disease that was brought by Western explorers and settlers. But that's actually not why the majority minority shift happened. It was because of the importation of labor. When Westerners settled in Hawaii, they created plantations that had a voracious appetite for labor and native Hawaiians did not want to work there. And there weren't enough of them to work there anyway, even if they wanted to. Uh, and so they imported labor from Japan, from China, from the Philippines, eventually from places like Puerto Rico and also Portugal. So they came from everywhere. And that's why if you go to Hawaii, you'll see last names from everywhere around the earth. The reception to these foreigners was not great initially. Uh, there was a lot of nativism, a, a, want, a desire to sort of maintain the status uh, of Kanaka, of people who are of indigenous Hawaiian heritage. Um, and the monarchy actually did quite a bit to try to sort of reinforce that status. But that changed. And it changed because Hawaiians leveraged their rich cultural traditions to recognize the virtues of foreigners and their humanity, but also their role in being guardians of Hawaii and being guardians of the land, the aina. And I think that is something that is incredibly didactic is that, you know, independent of how you feel about foreigners coming to your country, they are guardians of it. They become part of it and they are part of your team, uh, much in the way, you know, you may not be happy about, you know, your, your favorite football team or basketball team making a trade, but you certainly hope for the very best that the players play the best when they get there uh, for the sake of that right. team. And Hawaiians kind of had that um, enlightened view. It also led to a lot of intermarriage. So Native Hawaiians were actually financially incentivized. Uh, I should say the immigrants were financially incentivized to marry uh, indigenous families uh, for land access. And so many, particularly Chinese families, intermarried with Kanaka, with, with indigenous Native Hawaiian families as well. And that broke down boundaries remarkably well. And so, you know, when the assimilationist politics of the United States came around in the early 20th century, the non-white population, almost as an act of resistance against American assimilationism, uh, bonded together with Native Hawaiians in a sort of uh, uh, Native Hawaiian slash immigrant 
movement. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and it changed the way the Hawaiians saw themselves and saw their country. This isn't an audience question, but I'm curious. Do you think that it's easier to govern this majority minority milestone with a non-white person as president? No, actually. Uh, ironically, what psychological research suggests is that it would be easier if you had a member of the ethnic or, rel- or racial or religious majority uh, as your leader, easing a country into its diversification. Uh, a, a sort of trusted in-group person uh, is more likely to persuade any kind of fears or uncertainties among uh, the majority group. In, in fact, I think a lot of the sort of um, reactions to the majority minority milestone, it, it took place under the, the Obama administration, which itself heralded the demographic change that was uh, descending upon the United States. That's not to say that you know you shouldn't be electing uh, uh, people of color, of course, uh, that would be preposterous. But psychologically, if you want to know what people's propensities are, hearing from an in-group, hearing from someone who self-identifies as one of you, uh, as one of the majority group, is more likely to persuade members of that majority who may otherwise be skeptical. And that's actually not only from uh, my research, but from a number of other political psychologists. Yeah, that's very helpful. I just know that I want to ask some questions that I know are in people's minds, but are tough to ask. And, yeah. and I'll take the heat for it. Um, the next audience question is, you said that the, you said the backlash to immigration was a motivation for the book. Do you think that the backlash is against all immigration or just illegal immigration? No, I think at, at, we've reached the point in the United States uh, politics now where those who are anti-immigration are generally against almost any immigration, you know, and I know this just because we can use the attempt to pass some kind of immigration reform under the Trump administration as our guide. So around 2019, the Trump administration hatched a plan to shift to what they called a merit-based system uh, of points uh, of points where uh, immigrants would receive extra credits to be admitted by virtue of the credentials or qualifications that they bring to the table. And um, that bill was dead on arrival in Capitol Hill because the Republican caucus um, was against anything, uh, any kind of reforms to the system that that did not lead to the reduction of annual flows of people into the country. And so I think anti-immigration at this point, at least on the right of the country, uh, is just generally against any kind of immigration that would increase or keep immigration stable, even. And 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 to me, that's distressing actually, because I think that immigration is so important uh, to this country's future, um, nationalistically even. I think that when people decree illegal and undocumented immigration, in many ways, it's a justification for a broader anti-immigrant sentiment, because. Uh, that's just what we see in terms of you know voting habits and and rhetoric. So many immigrants, the vast majority of immigrants, you know, are entering the country completely legally with documentation. So, you know, I I, I don't think that it's just about the illegality of people who enter without authorization or overstay their visas. Understood. So this question, uh, Justin, we got twice: once before the program, once during the program, and so we're going to ask it. Is it time to end affirmative action? When I apply for jobs, they ask my race and sex and say it won't affect my selection. Then why do they ask? So I don't think I'm really qualified to opine. And that's what I was thinking. Yeah, Yeah. I think think this is a little outside of of my own range. What I can tell you is that, you know, the politics of affirmative action ends up being divisive. You know, we we are, and I think it's, it's, it's one of these kind of irresolvable matters in American politics. And it's leveraged by both sides uh, in order to politicize. But um, it's not something that I study closely enough to really have strong opinions. By the way, I just want to highlight that answer and say that it's okay to say, I'm not sure. I, that's I, how you know you I, should. I, that's why you know you should trust me. I, when, <laughs> I hope I hope people are taking notes. You know, it's all right. If, uh, if we don't know the answer, it's much better. Don't, than- don't trust any expert who knows the answer to everything. I know, and everyone's trying to be an expert these days and everything. Um, I was not an expert in Ukraine until three months ago. (laughs) So the next question I've got is uh, from an audience member named Liz Joyner. But I want to make sure I ask it because I think it fits well into this this piece of the conversation, which is, 
that a powerful and potentially frame shifting part of the argument that you make is that nationalism is the turf on which progress must be made. And you compare it to a bamboo finger trap that it tightens as, as you pull harder on it. Can you explain that phenomenon? Sure. So, you know, I, I, I think most of our you know listeners and viewers um, are familiar with the bamboo finger trap. It's one of these kind of woven bamboo tubes that you put your fingers in. And what you find is that the, the harder you resist it by pulling your fingers back out of it, the tighter it actually gets on your fingers, making it more challenging to release yourself. Because the human inclination when placed into the tube is to remove our fingers. But actually, the way to actually beat the trap uh, is to actually go with the tension of the bamboo finger trap by going inwards in order to loosen it. Only then will it loosen enough around your fingers to let you escape. And I think that nationalism is that way. Nationalism is such a powerful political force, such a mobilizer in our country right now. And I think it's being monopolized by only those who are on the right for the sake of nostalgia and for the sake of, uh, of their politics right now, Many of, much of which is anti-immigration as we've discussed already. But the left has largely abandoned that space. You know, They see nationalism as vile, as foul, as exclusive and restrictivist. Uh, and in many ways, in many cases, it is. Uh, nationalism can be that way. But nationalism is also, uh, at its core, uh, not about those things at all. It's, it's really just about um, the connection of, of a nation of people to their land uh, and, and the survival of that nation, the survival of the we, of who we are. And I think that um, the left would do very well for itself is to not treat it as a bamboo finger trap, because the more they resist it, the more they're getting defeated by it. What they really need to do is lean into nationalism and reorient it into something that can actually be a powerful justification for leftist goals. You know, for instance, uh, I think that, you know, there's a strong um, nationalist case for immigration that we've talked about because the survival of the nation depends on the sustainability of its population. And the only way we are going to be sustainable as a population is by either producing more children or letting people more into the country. And so immigration is a really powerful basis for national survival. Um, when it comes to healthcare, there's a lot of resistance to the to redistribution uh, and, and, and to the and to the provision of healthcare to everyone. Um, but actually, healthcare is the most nationalist thing you can provide because it lifts all boats. It strengthens the country's health. It leads to high, longer life expectancy, so that you don't need as much immigration. It also promotes a, a more healthy workforce and strengthens the economy. Uh, and, and many people who are, you know, uh, there are a lot of anxiety, uh, I think, uh, from a racial perspective, because there's this sense that, you know, Obamacare, for instance, uh, which is the most significant health bill in, 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 a, in a generation, was only benefiting minorities. But in fact, actually, the, the God's honest truth is that it was actually uh, being taken up by more white Americans than people of color. And so it really is uh, the kind of issue that is both in the national interest to have and one that actually helps everyone uh, equally. Uh, and so we shouldn't be so fussed about who in particular it's helping. It's helping the whole country. So anyway, there's lots of examples. Climate change is another good example. Uh, and this all comes from an article I wrote in the, in the Washington Post uh, about a month or so ago um, that people can reference. And uh, uh, but it's also in the book as well. I, I think I have the idea entitled for your next book, which is the liberal case for nationalism trademarked. So the next question I've got and actually builds on this a little bit is it seems the USA has always been searching for a universal cultural heritage, a meta narrative. Is that even possible? How can we accept the cultural heritage of various groups? And I would ask, and should we? We must. We have to try. We absolutely have to try. So it's going to be hard. And up until now, the sort of attempts to create some kind of universal heritage, uh, something unifying, um, has been subject to what I call thin nationalisms, as opposed to like thick. Um, thick nationalism usually is connected to ethnicity and religion and race, which, as we know, are really divisive and not suitable for a country as diverse and diversifying as our own. Thin nationalisms, unfortunately, are too thin. It's a Goldilocks problem. You know, you have something that's too thin or too thick. The thin nationalisms do not have enough of a sense of distinction. They use kind of liberal values, universal values uh, to connect people, but that are not uniquely American. We have to think hard about what it is that actually holds this country together. Yes, it's challenging to do that. Maybe it's an impossible goal, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue it. I think we have to think really hard. And I think that we have incredible uh, material to work with. You know, this country ultimately is a country that 
swoons over dreams. You know, we love comeback kids. We love, we love underdogs and we're all about dreams, but we're also all about struggle. And that common sense of struggle, that mutual understanding of dreams is something that unites all Americans because at our core, this country is really about a land of opportunity, a land of possibility. And in a way that no other country in the world can possibly relate to. And that is some really strong fundamentals to build off of. The other thing that we can build off, I think, is our shared heritage as immigrants. And certainly there is a, still a, a small minority of people of indigenous background in the United States, but even Native Americans in this country now are mixed in with people of immigrant heritage. Everyone is touched by some kind of journey to this country, which is a really big benefit when you compare to a country like Germany, for instance, where people actually, where the majority can actually you know, relate to some kind of heritage in the soil, in the dirt. Um, very few Americans can. And that's actually a way to bring us together so that we can all recognize the journey that all of us are in. And so I think we have a lot of strong material to work from. And it's a matter of building leadership and courageous people, um, millions of them, uh, who can leverage that into a common understanding of who we are. I mean, I think I think that is not only spot on, but it's going on the offense, you know, uh, stop succumbing to the problem, use it as an opportunity and, and then hold people's anxiety. What is your advice, uh, Justin, to organizations that are currently bridging and focused on bringing folks together and hosting those dialogues uh, for how they can be optimally effective for affecting positive change in the politics of identity? And I think part of your answer, actually, that last answer answered a lot of that, but I'm curious, you know, what, what do you think bridging organizations should do on this question? Sure. So they can definitely, you know, point by point, you know, think about those different pivots that we talked about already. They should definitely be in the conversation about who we are uh, and go into it open-mindedly. They should create safe spaces for people to say uncomfortable truths, to reveal what the, what's what's sacred to them, even at the risk of offending some people. Um, you know, I think in a, lot, a lot of organizations are already doing those things. The other things that I would add, though, is think about scale. We really need to go big. You know, you know, a, a local community dinner, wonderful. It has a, it has a wonderful effect. But for organizations that are more ambitious. Think about how we actually broaden this. You know, is there a social media strategy that you can pursue? You know, is there a way of actually reaching more people with megaphones out there that you can pursue? Um, it really matters. Now, that's not to discount small ways that each of us can play a role. I mentioned earlier that we need millions of leaders. You know, try to affect your own family, your own in, in organization, uh, your own business. Be your own governor, you know, and, uh, and I think that really matters. But we also have to think about scale, too. Uh, and then finally... You know, for those of you who do pursue scale, measure, um, see what effect you're having. You know, it's, it can't be good feeling is, is, is not enough. You know, we need evidence. And so work with researchers and consider how you can actually gather evidence uh, to recognize the change that you're building uh, and how you can actually help others do the same. How do you think we should talk about this in the language of not the left, but the center? What do you mean, Manu? So I think that there's a lot of questions about you know, how do we have conversations among one another to increase inclusivity? Or mm -hmm. how do you speak to and persuade our fellow citizens who hold native, oh, sure. anti-immigrant, anti-minority views? And the problem I have with all those questions is that if you immediately start off with, let's have a conversation about inclusivity, you're already turning off so many folks because those words have been politicized. Yeah, absolutely. How do we talk about this problem without politicizing the conversation? Sure. So there's two factors here. First off, the idea of diversity and inclusion has become, has connotations to it at this juncture. Uh, and I'm sorry to say this, it's not something I'm happy to report, but it has connotations among white Americans that this is not a space for me. And that is absolutely terrible for progress. You know, we, we need white Americans, especially white men in the room when we are talking about diversity and inclusion. They need to feel that they are a part of these conversations, that this is a space for them to share their vulnerability, for them to listen, but also to talk and that a place that they're welcome. And so, you know, I think that's a really important trend. And so those of you who are in the diversity and inclusion space um, have to ask yourselves, who's not here right now? Who's missing? Um, because those are folks who may be the people who need to actually be there the most, um, not to be educated, but to be included. The second thing is that uh, unfortunately, one of the risks of having only Joe Biden right now speaking about national unity as a priority is that we risk that it becomes a democratic prerogative, a democratic agenda, 
uh, when in fact it actually must be an American agenda, an American priority. And so it's very important that those on the left who care about this are cultivating partners on the right. You cannot do this on your own. And it's the kind of thing where you do not win if you are the one who gets credit for any progress that you make. You only win if you and someone from the other side of the aisle are also doing it together. It, it must be something that is done in, in, in conjoint, in, in coherence with the other side. And that's part of modeling the change that you want to see. Um, so I, I think that those are really big risks right now. And, and I see what you mean by that question now, Manu. Um, they're very important. It, international unity cannot be just a democratic ta- talking point. It must be an American talking point. It must be something that transcends partisan boundaries. Yeah, that is a fascinating thing to unpack. And I wish we had another hour, but I've got one last question for you. Um, And this isn't an audience question. This is another question that I think is highly relevant to this conversation. It's a personal one. And I think this will actually be a great way for us to to wrap up how people should be thinking about this. You recently wrote in USA Today about your father's uh, immigrant story. As we close tonight's conversation, could you say a word about, about your dad and the power of family stories and the power of our experiential stories and how they play a role in stitching this union together? Of course. Thanks, Manu, for, for, for asking about that. You know, my, my father recently passed away from, from cancer and, um, you know, it was a, it was a you know, tragic event in my family for sure, but it also in many ways was really powerful uh, in the way that it kind of connected to my own work, to my scholarship, to my profession. My father, as I mentioned at the, at the start, was a refugee. Uh, he came to this country with pretty much nothing. You know, he was in a New York tenement, a chicken farm in New Jersey, worked his way up to become a middle class uh, professional. And um, when he died, I, I, my family and I, we found uh, a stash of, of gold coins in a safe that I didn't even know about. Uh, next to a hunting knife and some government documents. It was the kind of thing that you would expect from like someone who was a fugitive or someone who was, you know, uh, fearing the apocalypse uh, was about to happen. And my, my father, of course, was not a fugitive and, uh, and he wasn't uh, a survivalist, you know, uh, in that kind of way. You know, I, I joke that my father didn't even like beef jerky. He was a refugee and, and ultimately what he was consumed by and it revealed uh, just the extent to which he was consumed was by this sense that it could all be taken away. At any given moment, everything he had could be taken away. And I think that that's somehow part of of who we are as Americans. I think that's part of the American condition. Um, So many of our families came here without nothing. And in a country this diverse, ethnically, racially, sexually, uh, religiously, geographically, culturally, I, I think that there's always going to be this consumption with status um, we are consumed with status. I think it's what leads us to fight over redistribution, to fight over identity politics. It's ultimately the, the sense of insecurity that everything you have could be taken away or negated. Um, and it's because of the instability that that was the sort of baptism of our arrival in this country. And, um, you know, the piece that you mentioned was a reflection on that. And, and maybe that is what holds us together. Maybe that is one of those things that transcends us as Americans that no other country can claim Uh, And it's not necessarily the most exciting part of who we are as Americans, but maybe it's the most poignant. So I'm happy to leave everyone with the story of my father. Uh, I'm happy that uh, to to the extent that he can inspire any of us uh, to to think more broadly about who we are. And if anyone's interested in more of these kinds of articles, um, they're welcome to check out my website, uh, justinguest.com, or follow me on Twitter at underscore underscore Justin Guest um, for more of this kind of content. But, uh, but yeah, you know, I think in any, in any of thing that we do, you know, our family becomes a piece of us and uh, we're expressions of them. Justin, thank you so much for your research, your hard work, justinguest.com. For anyone that's listening, please check it out, justinguest.com. And it's guest without a U, so G-E-S-T. Um, his book is Majority Minority. It is a fascinating read. And importantly, I learned so much just from that conversation. Thank you, sir, for sharing about your father. I'm going to take a quick minute to close here. Are there any last words that you've got? Anything else that you want the audience to leave with? Somehow we've managed to keep so many people's attention and there's hundreds of people watching across stream. So really quickly, I want to create space. Is there anything else that you want to touch on or cover? You know, people ask me, why are you so optimistic about the future of this country, despite all the evidence to the contrary right now? And my optimism comes from the fact that 
I don't actually even think we've tried to tackle the politics of demographic change this far. We've been going by the seat of our pants. So I think that all of us can be partners in addressing demographic change and thinking about how we pivot towards inclusion uh, and how we include each other in our, in our daily lives. And so that's the source of my optimism is that we haven't even tried. And, and if there's one thing that unites Americans is that when we put our minds to something, uh, we have a pretty good chance of succeeding. We haven't even tried. And, and, and for all those that are currently listening that are not on the Zoom, Justin's Twitter, Justin Guest, it's a handle with a beautiful butterfly. Please check that out as well. I just want everyone to know that the work that you're doing here is not only important, but as a 23 year old who's got to live with this um, and a generation that's that's not only mired in conflict and division, but a generation that has so much to live up to. It means a lot to have your book as a North Star in that conversation. I want to thank the Village Square. I want to thank uh, the Florida Humanities Program. I want to thank again, Justin, for, for his work. The note of optimism is so important. And lastly, I just want to say that there is a movement of people that are working on this problem, not specifically just the problem majority minority, but stitching our union together. Justin, talk about polarization. I work with an organization called Bridge USA. We work with young people across the country. We have organizations like Braver Angels, the Village Square, Listen First Project. There's so many folks that are doing this amazing work. And so if you felt compelled to act, I think that was the message that Justin wanted us to leave with, is act with optimism, approach the problem with urgency, and think about these solutions in a productive and constructive way. And we've got lots of opportunity to reap. Justin, any last closing words? No, just thank you to each of you guys and the various organizations for putting this together and for inviting me. Thank you, everybody. And again, Majority Minority, Justin Guest, justinguest.com. Thank you all so much. And thank you to the Build Square. Bye, everyone. Hey, hey, it's Vanessa back with you. Let's hear it for Justin and Manu. I thought they were both fantastic. And once again, Justin has really made me think. Don't forget about that other episode I told you about, episode 47, The New Minority. It's incredible as well. I think it's fascinating and wise to be able to look beyond what's happening in America and consider how other areas of the world have struggled with the same thing and how our human nature plays such a big role in how we see things. Justin's work helps us zoom out and consider aspects of this issue that we might not have seen before. You know, I thought Manu's question about why talk about this was very interesting because I'm a little older than him. Well, maybe more than a little, but I'm not going to tell you how much. Anyway, I lived through the don't talk about it phase. When I was growing up, I feel like the message was, we're all the same, we're all equal, so let's ignore our differences. It was like, if we acknowledge that we're different, somehow we'd be making a value judgment about who is better. So just ignore it. So we weren't raised to be comfortable talking about our differences. And I'll give you a little silly example that still unfortunately affected me in my adult life. Several years ago, when my son was about six, We went to the beach with a friend of his who's black and also the friend's mother. As I was sunscreening up my kids, the other little boy lined up right along with my kids and spread out his arms, eager to go next. Unfortunately, I think it was a little awkward moment for both of us moms, and I hate that I didn't just blurt out what was in my head, which was... Hey, I never thought about this, but does black skin require sunscreen? And because I didn't ask, I still don't know to this day if the awkwardness she was feeling was maybe just because she was uncomfortable using our sunscreen, or maybe it was because this wasn't part of their normal routine. And I really hate that I failed the moment by not talking about it. And by the way, just in case you're curious, I was curious and I googled it today and found out that dermatologists would say yes, wear sunscreen, even though the risk of burning is quite different. But anyway, the point is, I feel like my generation was not raised with the practice of exploring who are you and who are we? We didn't practice navigating in this space, even over minor things like sunscreen. So no wonder we're not equipped to tackle the bigger areas. 
I just love Justin's advice about talking to each other and exploring who are you, who are we, and who are we together. It's so wise. And it's actually exactly what we do here at the Village Square with our local color program. If you want to help us scale that by bringing local color to your community, reach out and we'll share how we do it and what we've learned. There's a contact form at the bottom of our website at villagesquare.us. That's also where you can sign up for our newsletter, which is the very best way to stay up to date with all that's happening at the Village Square. We'd like to give another big thank you to Florida Humanities for partnering with us to present this podcast series. You can find out about all the amazing things they do at floridahumanities.org. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to Village Squarecast wherever you listen to podcasts and drop us a review on Apple. Those really do help. We appreciate you listening to Majority Minority with Dr. Justin Guest. Until next time, we challenge you to reach out with an open heart and mind to someone who doesn't look or think like you. It changes everything. We'll talk to you soon, and thank you so much for listening to Village Squarecast. Cast.